Be blessed, my brother. Bless you. Come on, give the Lord a mighty shout. Hallelujah. All right. I can bring this back over. Wow, that was fun. Amen. And we'll get testimonies later. Um, you know, I've uh, done this all over the world for, for a while now, seeing God do a, a number of, of, of different things. So, you know, I just flow and, and believe for God to do what He does. Amen. How many of you guys know that if we just offer ourselves as willing vessels, the Lord's going to come and back His Word. Amen? If you ever get into that spirit, it's like, oh, I don't know, are miracles really happening? I mean, it's in the Word. Miracles have to happen. Healing has to happen when I step out by faith, when you step out by faith. Otherwise, it makes God a liar. How you guys know He's not a liar? Amen? He's not dead. He's not still in the grave. And He's not a liar. If we believe God and we step out on His Word, He will back His Word. Amen? Now... The, the fellowship of the word, it goes both ways. I can't be the only one stepping out and standing on the word. you got to stand on the word with me. Amen? you got to meet the Lord on the grounds of faith in the word as well when you come up here. So sometimes, you know, people's faith manifests in different ways, you know, for where they are, you know, with the Lord, where they are in the word. But sometimes God just comes down and, and does it, you know, regardless of where your faith is. That's what I like. Amen? Oh, so I'm open to however the Lord wants to move. Lord, if you just want to come in your sovereign grace and glory and, and just smack everybody and heal everybody, regardless of, you know, where we are in our faith walk, do it, Lord. Amen. Do it. But sometimes the Lord's like, even in the Bible, Jesus is like, do you believe I'm able to do this, right? He would stop people at times and he would say, do you believe I'm able to do this? Why, why did he do that? Because he was looking for agreement, right? He was looking for agreement. He didn't just want to use his faith and release the virtue of God for a moment. And then like, you know, five years down the road, they don't have faith for themselves. You know, and they get something else and Jesus isn't there in the flesh. We got to develop our faith. Amen. For uh, divine health, not just a moment of divine healing. Can I hear an amen? So sometimes the Lord will say, hey, you know, this miracle, this next miracle, this next healing is going to happen a little different because I want you to grow in your faith. I want you to walk in divine health. Amen. So I have a healing ministry. I have a healing anointing. That's a lot of times how the anointing moves with me first. And I also minister prophetically as, as we've been seeing, hey, at the house the last couple of days. How many of you guys were at those house meetings the last couple of days? Hey, somebody's like, I didn't get the invitation. It was a closed leadership meeting. Sorry. <laughs> just the way it is, right? Jesus didn't invite everybody to those closed meetings with the 12, right? It's just the way it is. Um, but man, we had some great meetings the last couple of days, huh? I did a ladies meeting this morning. Ladies, yeah. Oh, that's right. I mean, I got to praying for people and the ladies were like, ah, you know, and it was like, I was like, whoa, the estrogen, praise God. You know, I'm in a ladies meeting. Wow. It reminds me of the uh, glow days. Praise God. Right. I do a glow meetings every now and then. And uh, it was awesome, man. We got some mighty women of God in here. We got some Deborah's, some Esther's up in here. Um, but God moved and, and uh, speaking prophetically. And uh, he's healing people as well. And, um, you know, I, I might just uh, do a whole, uh, you know, dedicated meeting tomorrow night for healing. I don't know. We'll see what uh, direction the Lord goes. But I love to teach on healing. I love to, to minister it because how many of you guys know it's a part of the kingdom? Amen. Jesus said, when you heal the sick, tell them the kingdom of heaven has come near. Amen. When you cast out devils by the finger of God, tell them that the kingdom of God has come upon them. Amen. We want to see people healed and we want to see devils cast out because when that happens, it's a sign that the kingdom has drawn near. Amen. The sign that the kingdom of God has come upon us. And Jesus, as many of you know, when he first came on the scene, he said, repent, right? Which is metanoia in the Greek, change your mind, change your mind because I brought my world with me. In fact, it's at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. So when you operate out of what Jesus, out of who Jesus is in you and out of who uh, you are in him, the kingdom's released. Amen. The kingdom's released. And Jesus stretches forth his hands through us. Amen. We are his hands extended. Amen. We are his body. Right. So the ministry of Jesus continues today. It's been multiplied all over the earth, right? And that's what he meant when he said to his disciples, I must go away, but trust me, it's going to get better. Amen? That's Stephen's paraphrase. Every now and then I get into Stephen's paraphrase. I don't recommend you buy it, <laughs> but uh, he said it's going to get much better. Amen? The Holy Ghost is coming. How many of you guys happy for the Holy Ghost? 
He's everywhere, amen? He's everywhere. He's not confined to that little Jewish body that Jesus had. He's everywhere, and he's filling a body of people all over the earth. So uh, I want to say welcome. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we're going to have some powerful meetings. We're already having some powerful meetings, amen? But it's going to continue the momentum uh, of God's kingdom and glory. I believe it's just going to keep building, amen? Um, but my name is Stephen Powell. I have a ministry called Lion of Light Ministries. Praise God. I'm originally from Alaska, uh, but the last five years or so, I've been on the East Coast in the Carolinas. And then this last July, we moved to Phoenix, Arizona. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, Alaska to the Carolinas to Phoenix. I'm having like shock, you know, in my body from all the different atmospheres, right? Huh, but we're living in the desert. We're living in the hottest place on planet Earth. Praise God. It was so hot last year, it like took the breath away from us. We're like, what did we do? Did we hear, really hear God? Anybody ever been there, right? Did we really hear the Lord? But we know we did, right? Even though we don't always understand the reasons why God calls us places immediately, we know that God's in the middle of all of it. Amen? The Bible says He works all things together for our good. So we love Him and are called according to His purpose. So, Normally, whenever there's not whatever we call this thing, I don't know, the, we call it the pandemic, the scandemic, you know, whatever videos you've been watching. Um, but since we've been in this era, we, pastor doesn't even say it in church. I like that, the C word. <laughs> We're not even going to say it, right? But since we've been in that era, uh, you know, I've been uh, not ministering as much around the world, but used to, I travel all over, you know, all the time. But praise God, I'm getting out there more, starting to travel more. I just did a tour to the Northwest a few weeks ago to uh, Oregon and, and Idaho and Washington and back down through California. And I tell you, there's a real fresh wind of the Spirit blowing. How many of you guys have been feeling that in the Spirit lately? There's a fresh wind uh, blowing. And I tell you, you know, there, there was such a, a disappointment, you know, I think going back to January, there was such a, a hope deferred, makes the heart sick. And there was anger on Facebook. How many of you guys saw it? You know, it, 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 with Christians, you're like, did you lose your salvation, right? They just give it to the Lord, right? Um, but there was anger and there was confusion and there was letdown and there was all these things that we're dealing with. But God likes to come right into an atmosphere like that and say, you know what? I've served, I, I've preserved something for this day. Amen. Something great. And all your plans don't have to work out in order for my plans to work out. <laughs> in order for me to perform my plans. Amen? So uh, that's what I'm putting everything on. That's what I'm staking everything on. Not on the word of, you know, so-called prophets, but on the word of the Lord, on, on, on the scripture. Amen? And knowing that ultimately God has a plan and he's working all things according to the counsel of his own will. Amen? Ephesians 1.11. But, uh, you know, God's uh, just really encouraged me over the last few months. <clears throat> you know, People uh, are dealt with different ways when, when, when things happen, like just happened in our country. And the Lord did deal with me in my heart on some of the, the, the places that I had gone in my heart. You know, one of the things the Lord said was, Stephen, my kingdom's not of this world, right? But you've been a little too focused on the kingdoms of this world lately, right? We're so concerned about the future of America, and we're so concerned about this nation. And we should be, because we love this country. I don't know about you, I, lo I love America. Anybody with me? But ultimately, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, right? My kingdom is not of this world. And, uh, you know, we should be uh, people who are sojourners in this land. We should be people like Abraham who's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Amen? We should be people that's focused on the eternal more than the temporal. And when we're focused on the eternal more than the, temple, the temporal, it ensures that our message stays on point. What's the message? The message ultimately is not cultural transformation. The message is Jesus, and the message is the gospel. And if you preach the gospel, it will transform lives. And it will transform hearts. But we've kind of got this backward in the church, I think, the last few years. And it's good. We need to get off our you know, pews, and we need to get outside the four walls. and We need to be out there in culture and be the light and be the salt. Amen? But ultimately, it is the gospel that changes hearts. It is Jesus who changes hearts. And we can bring reform and we can change laws, you know, abortion laws, all we want. But if hearts aren't changed, men and women are still going to have the effects of sin in their lives. Amen? I don't just want abortion laws changed in this nation. I want to see women's hearts so radically touched by heaven that they don't want to go and murder their child. 
that what the enemy is corrupted within is so restored, they're so in touch once again with that maternal instinct that God put in them, they wouldn't dare lift their hand against that baby to feel what God feels. That's what it means to have a transformed heart. God takes a heart of stone, He turns it into a heart of flesh, and it begins beating like God's heart beats. You can begin to feel what God feels about things. You know how valuable that is? If only our senators and our congressmen and our leaders could feel what God feels about some of the things they're writing in the law. Oh, how different our world would be, right? But we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are supposed to represent the heart of God to the world around us. Amen? We're supposed to represent the mind of God. And it all comes through the gospel. It all comes through the message of Jesus coming, incarnating in human flesh, born of the Virgin Mary, coming and dying on that tree, gruesomely, horribly, for you and I, for the sins of the world. That God was in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reconciling the world back to Him. Amen? That's the message that brings transformation. Amen? Got to see people come to the Lord. That's what I'm looking for right now in America. We need reform, but my message of reform will not come at the expense of the gospel. I will not put the gospel in second place to any other message. Amen? The gospel is the cultural changer. The gospel is the, the agent of cultural transformation, right? When we talk about reformation, we do have a reference point in history. It comes from people like Martin Luther, John Calvin, right? But reformation came with the restoration of the Word of God. It came with a restoration and a promulgation once again of the gospel in the common tongue. It wasn't because Luther was brilliant. He wasn't brilliant, right? Because he had some bad ideas about the Jews. He had some deception in his life. He was human, right? But God used him powerfully for his part, and it was to get the gospel back to the common man and woman. Hey, when I use the term man, I'm talking about mankind, everybody, okay? <laughs> oh, but it was to release the gospel. Amen? Got to get back to the gospel. You know? Sometimes in the charismatic church, we, we, we think that other messages sometimes matter more. You know, I love talking about angels and I love talking about miracles. And I love talking about all these different things just as much as any other charismatic. But ultimately, it is the gospel that changes lives. Amen? Do not be removed for the simplicity that is in Christ, Paul said. Do not let Satan, who so easily beguiled Eve, don't let Satan beguile you and take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in the gospel. Amen? It was real simple for Adam and Eve. The word of the Lord came unto them. God spoke to them. And they were to respond to that word. They were to let that seed grow even within them and produce the life of God within them. But Satan came in subtly, even in that form of a serpent, and he began to pervert the word of God. Did God say, is what he said, right? Did God say, that's what Satan will always get to. He'll always go after the word. He'll always go after the gospel. And I believe that's the main thing that's responsible for where we're at right now as a nation. There's been a perversion of the gospel in this nation. Right? There's been a perversion of the message of who Jesus is. Right? I believe if we preach it the way Jesus preached it. I believe if we preach it the way the disciples preached it, the Holy Ghost would come and back that message the same way He backed their message. Amen? There's power in the Word. There's power in the Gospel. Read Romans 1. It is the power of God unto salvation. The Gospel. Right? The Gospel is the power. So, that's the first word I have for you tonight. Do you believe the Gospel? Do you believe it so much that you tell it to people? You preach it to others? You share it with others, right? Do you minister the gospel to someone who's hurting out there in the world before you mention a book to them to read? You know, all those things can help, you know, books and knowledge and learning and growing and all the different devices that we have out there. 
But ultimately, we need a change of heart. Amen? And Jesus is the one who does that. Praise God. But before I get any further, I just want to say just how much a blessing it is to be here. This is my first time in Nebraska. I want to thank the pastor for inviting me. Hallelujah. It's great, you know. There's grass. There's greenery, right? I live in the desert now, so I get around green. And I'm like, oh, thank God. Hey, I grew up in Alaska, you know, some of the most, uh, you know, beautiful uh, landscape on the earth, you know. So, uh, praise God. The Lord sent me to the desert, I guess, to humble me. Hey, oh, is there a water around here? Is that mine? Hey, it's mine now. Hey. Uh, you want to help me with this? Kisha, thank you. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Mark chapter 6. Praise God. You know, I grew up in Alaska. I was born and raised there. I was raised in the church. I was raised in a, a very conservative church. You know, if we were having revival in the church that I grew up in, you know, we were having like a, a leadership seminar, right? Or we were having like a John Mal Maxwell simulcast, or we were, we were reading, you know, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life, and we were discovering the purpose, right? And those things are all great and everything, right? But it's not what I call revival. Anybody else love revival in here? I love revival. I'm hungry for revival. <clears throat> But, you know, just the different flavors, you know, different strokes for different folks, you know, different flavors. I say it like this. Um, you know, there was one nation, but 12 tribes. Right. And, and sometimes you just got to find your tribe. Amen. And, uh, you know, I'm Pentecostal. I love the things of the spirit. I think I found my tribe. Amen. Um, but I remember the time when I was a teenager, actually, when I began to awaken to the things of God, I began to awaken to supernatural Christianity. Does anybody ever remember when, when that happened for you? Anybody? I'll tell you, it, it's an amazing thing. You can be saved. You can be, you know, know the Lord, but you feel like you get born again, again, right? When you begin to discover these things. I mean, the revelation for me that God is real and that he's still moving today in power, right? Around the world. And it's not all just theoretical, like in my head. That was huge for me, right? major shift. And that's what really grabbed hold of my heart, even as a, as a young person. I'm like, this, this is real. This is not just religion. It's not just books, you know, and, and duty, but this is real. I can know God. And I wanted to know God. Amen. That's one thing that if, if, if I would pray and I would ask the Lord for anything to come out of a weekend like this of meetings, I would ask that he would impart unto you a supernatural hunger to know God more, to know God no matter what the cost, amen, that uh, anything is worth putting on the altar to sacrifice when it comes to time, when it comes to things we're committing ourselves to, things that we have our desires and hearts wrapped up in. There's nothing more valuable than the presence of God, than knowing Him. And uh, it's like Paul, he said, I count all those things as dung, as nothing uh, for the excellency of of the knowledge of knowing Christ. Amen? I want my heart to, to, to live with that Scripture. I want to always be hungry to know Him. But as a teenager, God granted me the gift of hunger. And it is supernatural. It is a supernatural gift from above. Amen? There's uh, good people out there. There's good people in the church. But there's many people, they're not stepping into the things that God has for them because they're not hungry enough. They're not hungry enough. They're not hungry enough for the things of God. They're not hungry enough for the things that God has promised them, for the things that God has spoken to them. Amen? I pray that the things that God has promised you would become such a, a burning desire in you that you would be driven into the promises of God, that you would be driven into the reality of God's vision and plan for your life. Leonard Ravenhill once said, the reason why we don't experience revival is because we can live without it. We've learned how to live without it. Amen? And of course, we got to keep our sanity in the tarrying times, right? Joseph was on a process. He couldn't inherit the promise overnight, right? So we got to stick with God even when we're in process. But there has to be something in us that God does where we're driven into the things of God. Amen. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost drove Jesus into the wilderness, right? Jesus was driven into the call of God 
on his life, which went through the desert with temptation by Satan, but it was the power of God upon him driving him. Amen? That's what I pray. I pray the Holy Ghost would come upon you so powerfully this weekend that you'd be driven into the next phase of your calling. That you'd be driven into the next uh, steps along the way. I remember a, a prophet named Kenneth Hagin years ago was taken to heaven by the Lord. And uh, he'd been in ministry something like 15, 20 years. He was a, a Baptist pastor at that time in, in, in central Texas. And, uh, you know, he'd been pastoring for something like 15, 20 years. And the Lord took him to heaven. And the Lord's ministering to him. He's seeing Jesus face to face. And Jesus said, you know, uh, 12 months ago when I called you on the road and you locked yourself in the sanctuary for a day and fasted and prayed and and, and, and I confirmed to you that you were supposed to shift from a pastoral ministry to an itinerant ministry, travel around. The, the Lord said, you know, you know when that happened, uh, uh, Kenneth? That's when you entered your first phase of ministry. And he'd been in ministry 20 years. First phase. And, of course, you know, Kenneth Hagin, he tries to correct the Lord, right? <laughs> He's like, uh, I, I think you got that wrong, Lord. I, you know I've been in ministry 20 years. He's like, no, I got it right. First phase of ministry, right? And the Lord told Kenneth Hagin this that day. He said, many people live their entire lives. They're born and they die, and they never enter their first phase of their calling. They never enter the first phase of their ministry. Amen? So it's not enough to do stuff for God. you got to find what you've been uniquely tailored and crafted to do. you got to find what God has fashioned you for. And you have to, you have to be... I don't know what the word is here. You have to be completely unsatisfied with everything else until you come into that place. Amen? So, Lord, release supernatural hunger. But, you know, along my journey <laughs> through uh, charismatic land, the things of the Spirit, I've seen a lot over the years, right? I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I can honestly say God's done a work in my heart and I'm more optimistic, and I, I, I'm more expectant of what God's going to do, even with this church than ever before, regardless of how much humanity I've seen in the church, regardless of how much sin I've seen over the years, right? That's one of the things that Satan wants to do. He wants us to take us out of the plan of God. He wants to take us, even remove us from the body of Christ and what God's going to be doing in the body of Christ because we see people's humanity, because we see even leaders' humanity at times, right? How many of you guys know that Jesus loves the church? He loves his church regardless of our imperfections, regardless of our weaknesses. And he chose us even when we were still in sin, did he call us? Even when we were still in darkness, did he choose us? Amen? Um, so I pray that God would minister to men and women's hearts this weekend. Amen? Amen? In case you're wondering, I'm having a hard time ministering right now. I feel the glory. Uh, I believe there's someone being healed right now in your ears, a ringing in the ears, tendonitis. I rebuke that tendonitis right now in Jesus' name. And I command the ringing to stop right now in Jesus' name. And I command all the hearing to come back in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name. I love that when I'm Lord, I'm trying to preach a sermon here, right? And he just words of knowledge, you know, and uh, gifts. Hey, are you guys in Mark chapter six, chapter six? I'm trying to tell huh, a little bit of my story here and how I got to this revelation. But uh, oh, I feel drunk. Praise God. Hey, I'm not your package preacher. In case you haven't noticed, huh? I was never trained professionally. You know, I would. I was never taught how to put together a three-point sermon. I don't know what that is. I just prayed and fasted like you wouldn't believe in my 20s. That was it. Oh, I, I would regularly have times, seasons of fasting. I went on several 40-day water fasts, all this stuff, right? And I have regular times when I go to church, people are like, are you dying of cancer? Or like, are you okay? I was like so gangly. Hey, oh. But I just love Jesus. That's my qualifications. Anybody else love Jesus? Amen. Uh, but, you know, I began to, you know, as I continue to walk with the Lord, I began to experience several facets of God. 
you know when you get to the book of Revelation and you have those living creatures and it's like the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, right? The face, you know, these different faces, right? And those are those are aspects, I believe, of the of the nature and character of God, right? And even God, he has different names. He has different forms that he takes, right? He came through Jesus. He came through the Nazarene, right, in, in, in the Jewish nation, but he comes as fire. You know, the Holy Ghost came and he landed upon Jesus as, as that dove, amen? And he came and visited uh, Moses in the desert as a pillar of cloud and as a pillar of fire, right? God takes different forms and he has these uh, different names. And just when we think we've figured God out, he comes in a new manifestation. He comes with a new face, right? Oh, Shambhrakai, Shambhabaya. There's a scripture in the book of Acts. It says there'll be times of refreshing that will come by the Spirit of God, right? Times of refreshing that will come from the Spirit of God. There's actually a word in there. I, I believe the, the, the word actually is face. I don't know if you've ever studied this out, Pastor. The word is actually face. Times of refreshing will come from the face of God, right? And that's when we're refreshed in His presence. When you come into the presence of God, it's actually a face-to-face -face encounter of sorts, right? It's the intimacy, right? And I don't know about you, I don't want no one else right here in my grill except my wife, right? So that's the implication too. It's like no one can get here except for intimacy, right? Covenanted intimacy, amen? And that's what happens in the presence of God. He comes to have that bridal intimacy with His people, right? But there's, there's refreshing that comes from that. But you know, God has different faces, and sometimes we get used to one face. We get used to one manifestation. And then he comes in a completely new manifestation. And that's what happened with Jesus. When Jesus came to Israel, he came in a way that they did not expect. That they were not anticipating. And they missed their visitation. And Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that stones all the messengers, all the mouthpieces that God has sent here. You stoned them. You have missed your visitation. Another messenger has come. Another prophet has come. In fact, the prophet that Moses was talking about has come, and most of you can't see it. That caused the heart of God to weep. He weeps over that. Right? He weeps over His people Missing the visitation. And I just feel the heart of God saying tonight concerning this message that I'm supposed to bring forth. There's another move of God that's coming. There's another visitation that's coming. There's another time of refreshing that's coming. But how many people in the church are going to miss it because they're expecting Him to come in the way that they're looking for? They're expecting Him to come a certain way, in a certain package. And God, I don't think you should use that person. And God, I don't like the way they dress. And God, I don't like the way they talk. And God, they have sin in their past. Right? And how about this? You know, religious people had issues with certain packages like that in the past. But what about when if someone comes and they kind of look religious? What if we become religious in our freedom? What if we become religious in our freedom and we're like, God, we don't want a revivalist to come unless he comes looking like Stephen Verdict. I don't want a revivalist unless he comes looking like my favorite church, my favorite, you know, skinny jean wearing church. It can be both sides. It's not just the religious folk that miss it. You can be religious in your non-religiosity. You can be denominational in your non-denominationalism. Haven't you heard? Non-denomination is the new denomination. Right? Where's that water again? Hey, I'm like, I'm like uh, thirsty here. Hey, I'll just keep it open here. Is that all right? I'll get it away from the equipment. Praise God. But uh, along my journey, I had a series of visitations a few years ago. Now it's more than a few, year, a few, few years ago. It's four, four years ago. I was in Australia, a place called Adelaide, Australia. Actually, uh, Alexander Dowie's hometown before he moved to America. Anybody know who Alexander Dowie was? Alexander Dowie was a, a minister. He did end in deception, but before he ended in deception, God pretty much used him to single-handedly restore the ministry of healing to the church in the late 1800s. Um, he was the man that laid hands on John G. Lake, and John G. Lake was healed of like five degenerative diseases. 
and uh, he introduced the power of God to John G. Lake. And I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but the power that came out of that ministry with the apostolic faith mission and healing rooms. Anybody ever heard of the healing rooms today? Ministry all over the world. John G. Lake started that, right? Incredible miracles, incredible signs and wonders. But I was in his hometown in Australia, and I just turned 32 years old, and I had a visitation from the Lord that I was not expecting. I had a visitation from the Lord, and it was a new facet of His glory. It was, it was one of those faces that I hadn't quite seen before. And the Lord, is, and this may sound kind of gross, but this is what I saw in the encounter that came to me. The Lord walked up to me holding a large platter. It was a silver platter. You know, in King James, Jameis, it was a silver charger, and on it was the head of John the Baptist, right? So it was like that scripture where John the Baptist was beheaded. It was like coming alive through this vision that I found myself in. Anybody have visions, encounters, anybody? Well, that's for you today as well, amen? Our sons and daughters will prophesy. Our young men will see visions. Our old men will dream dreams because they're having naps all the time. No, I'm joking. Hey, I threw that one in there. Huh. But it's all in there, right? And nowhere does it say it was supposed to end and it was only for you know, the establishing of the Gospels like the cessationists say. No, the power of God is for us today. The power of God comes with the Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is here, the power of God's here as well. Amen? The Bible says that Jesus worked with the disciples uh, confirming their word with the accompanying sign and wonder. Amen? So God wants to work with His disciples today and confirm the word. Amen? with accompanying signs and wonders. But uh, the Lord handed me, okay, handed me this charger, and it was heavy. And he said, are you ready for the next phase of your ministry? And he actually said this to me, Pastor. He said, are you ready to lose your head for the gospel? <laughs> that was my promotion, praise God. <laughs> who wants to be a prophet? That's what I always say. We have all these people running around today, oh, who wants to be a prophet? Pay nine ninety, you know, to get into the prophet school, right? But if you read the Bible... You know, the track record of how things usually go for prophets. I think, you know, there's something there. I think maybe we better take a look again, right? I've found over the years, growing in the prophetic, growing in the seer realm, growing in the ministry of revelation, there's much more responsibility that comes, and there's much more uh, warfare that comes. A lot of warfare, right? And uh, I think we should almost put a disclaimer whenever we set up prophetic schools or, you know, school of the seer, learn how to see in the spirit. Uh, be careful what you see, because what you see you're responsible for, right? But the Lord came to me, and I felt the weight of a new ministry, and I believe it's the spirit and power of Elijah that God has promised for the last day's church, right? Now, I'm not claiming to be Elijah. Let's just get that out of the way. I am not Elijah, okay? Because there's been a little controversy since I preached this around the world. So people are like, I heard him. He said he's Elijah. I'm like, I did not say that. I rebuke you, you twisting Leviathan spirit in Jesus' name. How many guys know Leviathan? That's that twisting spirit. It takes your words and it twists it, right? And the enemy even wants to, what's that word? Gaslight. He even wants to gaslight you. And you start doubting. You're like, did I say it? Like, no, I did not say it in Jesus' name. But the spirit and power of Elijah came upon a messenger named John the Baptist. And it started with a visitation from the angel Gabriel. You guys remember the story? The angel Gabriel visited John the Baptist's father in the temple, right? And he didn't believe the word of the Lord, so he was struck as a mute for a certain number of days till the birth of this boy. But the Lord came to him and said, even in your older age, you're going to have a son, right? It was the word of the Lord. He said, this son will prepare the way of Messiah. The Messiah's coming. Amen? So uh, the, the angel Gabriel actually quoted Malachi, the prophet Malachi. And he said, he will begin to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. But it's very, very interesting because Gabriel didn't finish the prophecy, right? The prophecy in, in, in completion is he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Right? Why did Gabriel not complete the prophecy? I believe because it wasn't fully uh, fulfilled in John the Baptist. I believe that the spirit and power of Elijah that came upon John, it began to turn the hearts of the Jewish fathers to the Gentile children that would begin to come into the kingdom. Right? Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. But then there needed to come another 
anointed. They become the spirit and power of Elijah in the last days to begin to turn the children back to the fathers. And what is that? That's a restoration of the Jewish apostolic gospel. The gospel is Jewish. Jesus is Jewish, right? And Satan hates that. Huh. When he's coming again and when he reigns from Jerusalem, he's going to reign not just as king of you and king of I and king of the whole world, but he's going to reign as king of the Jews too, amen? Oh, no matter what's happening in Jewish politics today, it's going to turn to a kingdom eventually, amen? All those prophecies are going to be fulfilled. But the, Gabriel, the, the angel Gabriel came and announced his birth, and there was an anointing that was released, and the Bible said he began to upbraid the people. The Bible said he began to speak a message that they had not quite heard up until that point, up until that time. And it was a preparation. It was a message of preparation, but it was also a serious message, right? I'm telling you right now, there's a prophetic anointing that is coming to the earth that's beginning to prepare people's hearts like never before, I believe, for the coming of the Lord. But it's a very, very serious message too. Because how many of you guys know one of the faces of the Lord is He is loving and He is kind and He sticks closer than a brother, but He is also a severe judge. He is God. Amen? He is not the God that many people in America have made Him into. He's not your next door neighbor. He's not even your earthly father. Okay? He's your heavenly father. He's God. Amen? And the Bible says that When those skies split, he's coming back to judge and make war. Revelations 19.11. This is the message that began to fill me at that time. All these scriptures began coming to me. Uh, The the Bible opened up to me in new ways. I'm like, Lord, I don't know why, but I seem to avoid that part of scripture for a number of years. Anybody can relate? The seasons change, and it's like different things begin to open. The book of Revelation began to open to me. Um, Other parts of the scripture began to open to me. Scriptures like this in Mark 6, it began to open to me. And now, of course, when I had this visitation, I went to the scripture because this is the this is the chapter where John the Baptist is beheaded. But the Lord gave me some prophetic things that I felt I needed to share here tonight. So uh, let's start with verse 12. The Bible says they went out and they preached that people should repent. Right now, this is the beginning in Mark's gospel of when Jesus began to send out the disciples, right? There is always a a, a message of repentance that comes first, right? There's always. If you study uh, the ministry of John and Jesus and you put them together, you notice that they actually said the same thing when they came on the scene. The first words that are recorded for both their ministries when they came on the scene is repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They said the exact same thing. Why? Because the Lord wants us to know it was the same spirit. It was different phases of the move of God, but it was the same Holy Ghost that was ministering through them. Amen? And the Lord wants to bring a Jesus movement. The Lord wants to bring a fresh Jesus movement to America that's filled with signs and wonders, that's filled with power, that's filled with the casting out of demons where people are coming to Jesus and getting saved. But there has to be a John movement first, always. There has to be a baptism, and the church has to receive it, and it's called the baptism of repentance. I'm going to begin to allow the Lord to bring repentance, which is a changing of my mind. He's going to begin to open me up to to, to thinking differently, even about God, because God is about to come, and if I don't receive the spirit of repentance, I may miss Him because I have the wrong mindset about how He has to come. Are you following me? That's what I sense on my heart tonight, that God would even use me prophetically to release a preparatory message in the spirit and power of Elijah that we need to humble ourselves and we need to acknowledge that as much as we know about God, we know nothing. All the theologian experts out there, they know nothing compared to all the things that we're yet to discover. We're going to spend eternity and eons upon eons learning about who God is. And even after eons and eons, we would have only scratched the surface. Amen? We need to humble ourselves and have the right heart and say, God, whatever you want to do, I'm open. Whatever you want to do, I'm open. Now, there are certain things that are immutable and that are unchangeable that are found in the Word of God. And there are markers always of a true move of God. I believe one of the immutable unchangeable markers, it will always have the word at the center, right? 
It will always have the word at the center. That's why even when Jesus came, and he had the authority right to even keep writing Scripture, what Jesus said ended up in the Scripture, he would always refer back to the prophets. Why? Because he was honoring a system that God had put in place called the Holy Scriptures. And when he came to the Jews, he said, does not the volume of the book that's been collected from all the prophets and the law, does not the volume of the book testify of me? He used the Scripture to authenticate even his own ministry to the Jewish people. How much more, okay, should we use the Scripture to say, hey, this is what I'm standing on. Here's the reason why I'm standing on it. Amen? If I come before you and I preach a message and I have anything, any authority whatsoever to do what I'm doing, it all comes back to what Jesus said in this Word. And let me tell you something. The words of Jesus are not just found in the Gospels. It's Genesis to Revelation. He embodies the Word. Amen? He embodies the Word. So that's an immutable and unchangeable marker that will always be at the center of a true move of God. It will be the Word of God. Amen? That's what connected Pastor and me. Right? We have a value for the Word of God. Even in hard times, when it's hard to speak certain truths, we have to speak those truths. We have to preach that word. We have to minister that that message and trust that God is going to back it. Trust that God is going to do what He does. Right? Sometimes we draw back from ministering the word and we're too much in our mind and we're like, God, you know, I don't know if they're going to psychologically respond good to that scripture. Right? Let me tell you something. We can trust the Holy Spirit's lead. Right? We can trust that if God puts that word on your heart and if you minister to it faithfully, the Holy Spirit's going to use it. Right? I think that's what we've done in the American church. It's like, we're not going, we're not ministering out of that book anymore. I've actually heard this from some churches. They're like, we don't minister out of the book of Revelation here at this church. We don't minister out of, you know, some of these other books, you know. There's some people that are in the grace movement, they don't minister out of James. I'm serious, I've heard this. They say we don't minister out of James because we believe historically James was just a transitional book to help religious Jews get over into the New Covenant. Right? And of course, hypergrace people hate James because James is like, show me your faith. I'll show you my faith in works. Right? And they're like, I don't have to work. Hey. And the Lord's like, your faith's dead if you don't have works. Right? Whoa. But we don't want to miss the visitation of God that I believe is upon us right now. And we need to take this serious. Amen? We need to come before the Lord like David did and say, search my heart, search my inward parts. See if there's anything within me that's not congruent with you and your message for the hour. See if there's anything that's within me that is resisting God. If you really ask the Lord that question honestly, it might shock you what the Lord reveals is in you resisting Him, resisting His Word. Now, I don't want people to get too overly introspective and be in fear, you know. Oh, is there something in there? Trust me, the Lord will reveal it as long as you're seeking Him. Amen? Amen. But there was a repentance that began, and this is like a fresh wave of the move of God, right? We were talking last night, the move of God usually comes in waves, right? The Lord knows that we can't handle, you know, just a big wave that's consistent for years and years, so it comes with a wave, and then it dies down for a little bit. And we're supposed to establish, even in our culture, even in the church, even in our hearts, everything that God brought in that wave. Amen? But everything that God brought in the last wave that was meant to establish us in this season, ultimately, that's to prepare us for the next wave. And I have news for you. God is not done with America. God is not done with this world. God has, has not hung up, you know, his revival cape or whatever. I'm telling you, he's about to... Get that thing back into action. Praise God. But they preach that people should repent. I tell you, if the message of repentance doesn't come out at least every now and then in a minister in a church, I would begin to wonder. Now, on the flip side, I would wonder if they're talking about repentance every Sunday too, right? It's like, give it a break, buddy. Talk about the love of God. Hey. (laughs) But uh, repentance always comes as preparatory. Amen? to prepare the hearts for what they're about to experience, for what they're about to encounter. It says, then once the repentance went forth, verse 13, they cast out devils, right? They cast out demons. Even the power of Satan many times cannot be addressed in our lives until God grants unto us repentance, right? 
Once again, the word metanoia, to change your mind. Many times, we, we've been talking about this inner healing. Many times, the thing that has granted Satan the access to begin with is your stinking thinking. What you're agreeing with Satan on by the lies that you believed, by the lies that you've allowed to remain upon your lips. You shall eat the fruit of your lips. <clears throat> It says they anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So notice the order, preaching, repentance, dealing with the demonic, then healing. Amen? There's some people you can't get healed until you deal with the demon. But there's many people you can't deal with the demon until you preach the word and until the Holy Spirit comes and grants unto them the gift of repentance. And it is by the grace of God. I don't want fake repentance. I don't want you to just try to make me happy by responding to my altar call. I want you to respond to the Holy Ghost that's drawing you. And that's what I see. If you want to ask me what I really see for the next move of God in America, I see a supernatural draw from the preaching of the Word. I see the Word hitting stadiums. I see the Word hitting the airwaves. I see the Word hitting churches and men and women responding to the Word again. Right? We've responded to celebrity preachers. We've responded to men and women that have, you know, the, the Greek oratory skills, whatever, right? We've responded to all sorts of things that in the end, many times, is demonic and sensual. Many times is of the arm of the flesh what anybody could do without the Holy Ghost, right? But God is about to do something, I believe, with the ministry of His Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ, that every man and woman that sees it will know that was God. That could not be produced because you were brilliant enough, because you went to school for enough years, because you had a high enough IQ. Only God could do that. Right? An undeniable move of the Word and the Spirit. Amen? I don't know if you know American history, but there was a man named Charles Finney had an incredible ministry of the word now of course you know he was in a season in the church and you know there's some doctrine that he believed that i don't know what he was thinking there but god used him powerfully right here's another marker of a next move of god many times god will ask some of the messengers that begin to arise to pioneer a move a new move he'll ask them to do things outside the box He'll ask them to do things that are uncomfortable, that are outside the norm, right? That will get them in trouble in some places, you know, with the religious established hierarchy, right? So in the day of Charles Finney, the way you would preach is you would write down your sermon in full-length form and you'd read it word for word off your page, right? But Finney felt moved by the Spirit to preach from his heart. Why? Why? You see, this is what I'm doing. I have no notes, just so you know. I never have any notes. Because <laughs> I know when I'm coming with my prophetic hat on, I minister from the heart, right? Now, I'm a teacher too, but when I teach, I have to be really disciplined, right? Because the prophetic, the prophet in me just wants to go all over the place, right? But the teacher, it's like line upon line. I need to teach him something here, hey. Uh, but Finney, he wasn't just an evangelist. He was a prophetic evangelist. He was a prophet and an evangelist combined. And when you're a prophet, when you have a prophetic gift, you have to speak from the heart. That's where the power comes from. The Lord anoints the word with the word that comes out of your heart. Amen? So he began to preach these prophetic sermons, and it was revolutionary from the church, right, at that time. And the power of God began to visit his services when he would just free flow, preach from his heart, and some of the manifestations of the Spirit that accompanied the word. I tell you, saints, there were times, how many of you guys have ever heard this expression, they got slain in the Spirit? In my studies of church history, I believe that expression came from Finney's meetings. Here's how it came. Finney would begin to speak, okay, and there were times that he got really loud, okay? And he noticed that when he began to get really loud, even his voice, the volume, okay, of his voice, people would begin to manifest under the power. Right, And there were times he got really loud praying and preaching, and people would just start flying out of their chairs. They'd start falling out of their chairs. And someone pinned it in some journal somewhere. They said, I was at the service tonight, and it was, it was as if the Lord Jesus was walking around with a sword slaying people. Slaying people. Just when he got too loud. Right? I get too loud, people are like, oh, right? 
man, what a thing. What if God could anoint us? What if we could be so filled with the power of His Word that God would begin to come and touch people by power, the power of the Word? Right? And even Satan can do miracles. There's lying signs and wonders that the Bible talks about. The Bible says there were spirits on those Egyptian magicians and they came and duplicated the same miracles that Moses did. And it's warned about in the New Testament that this will happen in the last days. There'll be men that will come and there'll be lying signs and wonders. But let me tell you something. The power and demonstration of God that comes through the Word, that comes through the true Gospel, Satan can't duplicate that one. He can't duplicate that one. He can whip people up into soulish hype, but that kind of power that comes through the preaching of the Word, that's the Holy Spirit's business. Amen? That's where the power is, I believe. I believe it's in the Word. That's the sword that Jesus wielded. That's the sword that the apostles wielded. That's the sword that shook the then known world, the Roman Empire. And the Lord's looking for men and women. Will you dare to bear the sword in your generation? Will you dare to bear the sword in America nowadays where in certain places it may get you put in jail? It may get your nonprofit status pulled. If there's some swords that you bear in California right now, you're going to have trouble. If you want to bear the sword of a certain story in Genesis that sets homosexuals free, you're going to have trouble. But I tell you what, man, I met a homosexual a few years ago in one of my meetings that got saved. And she said, the preaching of the word that came in that story of Sodom and Gomorrah set me free. I heard the story. I don't even know what happened, you know, but I heard what God felt even about that sin and all the feelings and emotions and attraction that I had for that same sex partner left. And I was delivered. Delivered. Just by reading the story. There is power in the Word. There is power in the truth. And we have no right to withhold it from men and women around us who are hurting, who are dying, who are lost. They're the blind leading the blind. They need the light of the Word. Is not His Word like a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path? Our country needs direction. And it's going to come, I believe, from the Word of God. From the truth of God's Word. That was the lamp. That was the light that lit the path for America for a long time. But we've strayed from that. We've strayed from that. We replaced the tenets of Scripture with man's wisdom, with man's ways. And God wants to remind men and women of why He raised up this nation to begin with. Amen? Verse 14, you guys still there? Mark 6. It says, Now Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. This is talking about Jesus. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, therefore these powers are at work in him. Herod, I would like to give you some advice. That's right, I'm talking to Herod. Hey, I would like to give you some counsel. Don't make up your mind about who this man is until you consult God on it first. We look at a vessel, we look at a person, we make up our mind, we make a snap judgment. This is who they are. This is what box they belong in for me so I can deal with this thing. That's why a lot of times why we make snap judgments. Because we got to put them in one of our boxes because we don't know any other way to cope. Right? We, we, we have a hard time just hanging out in that space where we're like, God, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, right? Have you guys ever, ever been to a church or you've ever been a, a, under a ministry where it's like you feel God, but this is weird, right? You feel God, but it's a little unsettling, right? I'm going to have to be that Berean and go break out the word a little bit later, right? <laughs> got to see this, amen? That's okay. It's okay to be in a place where you say, God, I don't have this figured out. I don't know what's going. I believe James chapter 1, any of you that lacks wisdom, ask of the Lord. He will give it because he gives it liberally to those who ask. He will give it. It may not come today. It may not come tomorrow. But God will give you a word to stand on. God will give you direction if you consult him. Right? And I just feel like God's speaking through this story of Herod. He's speaking to his leaders in the body of Christ right now. Don't label immediately what this new move of God is when it begins to move on the scene. When it begins to come 
into your sphere, into your stratosphere, right? Herod had already heard about his name. He had become well known, but then he made a decision about who he was, and he was among those who missed the Lord, right? We miss the Lord many times because we make judgments out of our own human thoughts and human opinions. We ought to be people of revelation. We ought to be people of prayer and meditation. People that think deeply on the things of God. People that are open to God leading the way on how we decide to label things. Amen? I believe, I don't know about you, but where my faith is, God will always give me a scripture. Is anybody else there? The Lord will always give me a scripture. That's the miracle of scripture. Amen? I know you can't like see that there's cars in the word of God. And, you know, like Facebook's not in there, right? There's all kinds of modern day technology, different things. It's not in there. But there's a story for everything. Amen? There's a verse for everything. And the Bible is not just for doctrine. It's not just for, you know, the things like that. But the Lord will speak prophetically right through the scriptures into your life. Amen? That's the beauty of it, right? The spirit of prophecy handles the word of God in your life. Now listen to this, verse 15. This is Herod trying to put Jesus in a box, right? To understand him, to try to understand how to handle him. It says, verse 15, others said, it is Elijah. So he was on to something there, right? Because it was the spirit and power that was on John the Baptist that kind of kicked off this whole new move, right? So he was on to something, but he still couldn't grasp it right he still couldn't put his finger on it says, others said it is a it is the prophet right now when it says the prophet that's referring to the prophet that that moses spoke about right there's the prophet in the old testament moses said there's coming a prophet greater than i right and all the jews were looking for him isn't it interesting everybody in the church can be looking for the move and many can still miss it isn't that interesting i'm telling you the church has to receive a fresh grace of repentance in this hour. There are many things being exposed. I'm not going to get into the politics of everything that's happened in the U.S. over the last few months, but I have news for you. There were some major things that were exposed in the body of Christ in January. There's some major things exposed in the body of Christ these last four years. And we better have eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that the Lord is trying to communicate to us. I'm telling you right now, I love what God did through Donald Trump, but God does not need Donald Trump. God does not need any man, any woman. He does not need things to go the way you think they should go politically in your nation. Things are going pretty good politically in heaven. It's called a kingdom, and there's no elections, and God wins every time. (laughs) Amen. I like those odds much better. It just relieves me, right? Oh, there's no elections happening in heaven. Hallelujah. I just think on that every four years. <laughs> right? But you can't vote Jesus out. I'm sorry, Joe Biden. You can't vote Jesus out. You may think you went to work for the American people. You know, whatever that is to a liberal nowadays. I don't even know. But you may think you went to work for the American people. I have news for you, Joe Biden. You went to work for God. What I just said there is straight up scripture. Nebuchadnezzar came in, took over Israel. All the all the Israeli people are pointing their finger. You usurper, you 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 Gentile, you foreign invader. And the Lord's like, he's my servant. And they were like, mind blown, right? And then Jeremiah comes along. He's like, yep, he's God's servant. They're like, put that guy in jail. Put him in prison. That's not the word that I asked for, Jeremiah. Oh, we're calling out to God. God, give me a word. And when the word comes, put him in jail. Kick him off the conference card. Don't let him on the apostolic circuit anymore. That's not the word we're looking for. Right? I was telling Pastor there, Ezekiel nailed it. The Lord's like, I'm going to come and speak to you according to the idols of your heart. The Lord said, the reason why I'm going to come and speak to you according to the idols of your heart is because you asked me according to the idols. So if you pray to God about an election according to the idol in your heart, God will come and answer you according to your own idol. And it's right there in Scripture. I didn't make it up. I didn't come up with that idea. It's all God. If you want to get mad with someone, get mad with Him. 
But there's some idols in our heart. Let me tell you something. No man, no politician, no president has the right to assume the place of Jesus. And I'm not saying that that was intentionally done, but it absolutely happened in many people's hearts. Our hope was absolutely in a man and in a movement. But let me tell you something. The movement of the kingdom of God will never fail you. Political movements in America will come and go. There'll be new ones that will be born. There'll be old ones that will flame out. But the movement of the kingdom of Jesus will never flame out. It will never die out. And he will never let you down. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm preaching, Pastor. Hey, so good to be preaching again. Did any, any of you follow me like on YouTube or whatever? I, I saw a few, right? It's like I can't get my preach on there, right? In that little studio. Oh, man. So good to be back in the church. Praise God. Huh. But, you know, he's, he's trying to, to, to pinpoint it here. Is it Elijah? Is, is it the prophet or like one of the prophets? But he doesn't get it, right? Why doesn't he get it? Because you can't get the gospel, and you can't get the gospel of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, by figuring it out. It's not something that can be computed. You can't even go to school to figure it out. It has to come by the gift of the Holy Ghost. It has to come as a gift of revelation. The light has to dawn upon you. The light has to break through the veil of darkness that's been over your mind and your heart for all these years. Amen? So in America, we should quit trying to do God's job for Him. It's not my job to convince you to like Jesus. That's not how I tailor my ministry. So many of the churches in America, they're like, I have to get you to like me so you'll like Jesus. That's been the mentality. But I believe if you preach the Word, the Holy Ghost will do His job. I don't have to convict you. The Holy Ghost is the one who brings the conviction. I can't save you, only Jesus can. Right? I can't convert you, only the Holy Ghost can. Amen? The Lord gave us a clear, simple commandment. Preach the gospel. Right? Preach the gospel. Now, there are some things, you know, where Jesus said, count the cost. You know, like, have some strategy here. Think about it. But I think when it comes to the gospel, it is the power. Amen? Just let it out. Amen? Just let it out. Release it. Watch what God does. Verse 16. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. Right? So once again, I think it's interesting. I think Herod recognized the same spirit that was on Jesus that was on John. I think he recognized the move of God. And I believe there was some dread in him as well. I don't believe... We're going to read the story in a second. I don't believe he, he, he fully wanted to, you know, behead John. But he was enticed and he was tricked by that spirit of Jezebel and the woman that he was with, Herodias and Herodias' daughter, right? And I believe that the God is speaking to leaders right now in the American church. Do not fall prey to the temptation and the pressures of Jezebel in this next season to cut off the move of God when it comes. To cut off the messenger's when they come, because that is a pressure that comes every time a move of God hits the earth. There's that Jezebel spirit that comes around and says, sequester, put that, put that thing in prison, right? So what is that? That's when the move of God comes and you try to control it. You're putting all your chains on it. You're putting all your fetters on it. You're putting it in, the, in a certain cell, in a certain block, in a certain place. You're like, we're open to the move of God, but it can only happen this way. All things decently and in an order, right? Oh, yeah, we use Scripture to justify our sin all the time, many times. But uh, there's times in revival where you have to take your hands off and let God be God. Amen? Let God be God. I, I believe that we're called to govern among men and among people, people, but I don't believe the Holy Ghost needs governing. I believe the Holy Ghost can govern Himself. Amen? But it says here, because verse 18, are you guys with me? I know I'm a little long-winded. Just bear with me. Let me get the burden of this message out. Praise God. For Herod, Herod the Bible says, uh, or excuse me, verse 18, because John had said to Herod. Now, this is why Herod decided to put him in prison. It was because of what John said. Okay? It wasn't even his message preceding this moment 
in which he addressed Herod personally. Right? He pinpointed something in Herod's heart and Herod's life. It wasn't even the message that preceded that. It was when John decided to address him personally. Now listen to what I'm saying here. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. That's right. When a real move of God comes, God will begin to call people into account. God will begin to hold up the standard of Scripture to people's lives. And he'll begin to say, I'm pouring out my spirit and empowering you, not so you can continue to live the life that you used to live. I'm empowering you to become who you always meant to be. Amen? But uh, you better believe that when the Spirit of God gets moving, you better believe, even in this last days, that God will continue to confront sin. Fearlessly and with courage. Did you hear what I said? God will continue to confront sin. Now, I know we've been in a place in the church the last 20 or 30 years where there's been a lot of people delivered from religion. Anybody in here? I know I'm one of them. Praise God. I'm telling you, the religious demon is just about as ugly as anything, right? And it's so ugly because it dresses itself up like God. It dresses itself up, you know, it's like the pig with the lipstick. You know, it dresses itself up as holy, but it's anything but holy, right? You want to learn about the religious uh, uh, spirit? Just look at all the encounters Jesus had with the Pharisees, you know? It's just wonderful theater, praise God. You whitewashed tombs, <laughs> right? You, you brood of vipers, holy men of God. It's like, whoa, that was serious stuff, right, for the holy men. <clears throat> but Jesus knew. He knew by the Spirit of God. And I have news for you. John knew as well, and he called out the sin here, right? Now, let me tell you something. When it's God that calls out sin, it's always redemptive. Can I hear an Amen. When God, when God calls out sin, I believe it's for one of a few reasons. Number one, I believe it's because there's a moment, an opportunity of grace for you to get free from it. Amen? There's times when I'll be ministering to people or I'll just be with, with, with different people and God will reveal things to me, but I always minister those words redemptively. I always minister them like this. I say, God is setting you free today, right? I don't say you're bound and you need to repent, you horrible person, right? I say God is offering an opportunity to escape today, right? So there's redemption always in it. But also, God will at times call out sin, and at times he'll even release judgment. Even in the New Testament, it talks about God releasing judgment for the good of all, for the good of the nation, so that we might see that he is God. And that Galatians 6 still applies. God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the Spirit, eternal life. If you sow to the flesh, death. God will not be mocked, right? So there's certain things that are going to come, I believe, in this next season that will be a message to America. I will not be mocked. I meant what I said. I blessed you with these blessings. And I, I did such amazing things in your nation. Revival after revival, and there is responsibility that comes with that, right? There will come that in this next move of God. But let me tell you something. God is going to confront sin, I believe, in an, on an incredible level because he intends to set millions of people free. You, you think it's confrontational now with the homosexual spirit? You, you just wait until the Elijah messengers come on the scene and start to tangle with those spirits. You just wait, right? When Elijah came on the scene in Israel in the Old Testament, in case you're wondering, if you want to know what was happening with the ministry of John the Baptist in preparing for the Jesus move, you have to go back to Elijah. And you have to look at the ministry of Elijah. Elijah came on the scene by divine grace and by divine opportunity at the exact moment that Israel needed such a wrecker. That Israel needed the type of man and the type of anointing. It could be a woman too, praise God. But the type of anointing that was on that vessel, Israel needed it at that moment because they were at a tipping point as a nation. Are we as America going to go the way of these evil spirits? Are we going to go the way of Baal? Or are we going to turn back to the Lord? There comes a tipping point. There comes a moment of opportunity. There comes a place of no return. But God always sends, I believe, the Elisha messengers at that time to confront the powers of darkness that are in the land. Are you hearing me? There's been a showdown even the last few years 
with the spirit of Jezebel, with the altars of Baal, even in the There's been Ezekiel moments where the Lord has brought prophetic ministers behind the scenes, even in the spirit, to see what's been happening behind the scenes in the house of God, to see the abominations in ministries that claim to represent Jesus with signs and wonders. God has exposed many of those things these last few years. And I'm telling you right now, it's only just begun. He will expose and he will sift and he will confront because he loves us that much. He loves us too much to leave us in our sin. And I'm sorry if I may sound like one of those old religious people that you got delivered from, but I hope you sense the Spirit of God on this. I hope you sense the heart of God. Amen? I, I could care less what, peop- one, what person sounds like. I want to know, are they bearing the heart of God? Are they being led of the Spirit? Are they ministering the Word, the Word of life, not the dead letter of the law? Amen? I hope you're being ministered to by the spirit of grace tonight as the Holy Ghost ministers here. But Herod was confronted with his sin. And at that moment, it was either his sin was going to endure or he was going to take out the prophet. And when the Lord sends Elijah messengers to his church, they have a choice. Either they're going to reject the messenger are they are either they're going to reject this next move of God or the sin is going to grow in that church. The sin is going to grow in that place. There's a time in the early church, I believe, where God granted opportunity and I believe they chose the wrong way and the church grew into pagan Rome. The church grew into something that it was never called to be. But we're in a, a time of, of restoration. How many of you guys know God's been restoring, amen, over the last 500 years? And ultimately, this is going to end in a bride. This is going to end in a bride, a glorious bride that looks just like Jesus, who has the heart of Jesus, who carries the integrity, the character, the love of our Lord, but moves in the power of our Lord. But let me tell you something. Not everybody is going to be found among the bridal company. There will be the foolish virgins in these last days. And they will be among those that have not been prepared. You remember the foolish versions? They weren't ready when the call came. Why were they not ready? Because they did not listen to the messengers that God sent them. The Johns that preceded the Jesus with a message to prepare the people. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It's more than just... What God can do for me now in my life, the blessed life. Are you ready for eternity? In a moment, in one single breath, you could be there. You could be standing before the beam of judgment seat of Christ. Are you ready? That's a message that must fill the pulpits once again in America. Amen? Herod was not ready, so he missed his opportunity, and he was used by Satan to facilitate the cutting off of a ministry, a precious ministry. How many more souls could God have used John to prepare? It says, therefore, verse 19, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, right? So it doesn't just happen all at once. There's levels. There's phases of cutting off the voice of God, of rejecting the messengers. It's like the Lord was saying, "Uh uh-uh, not yet, right? Uh Uh-uh, not yet. And the Lord's even saying that in America. There may be great gross darkness that will continue to come, like the the Bible says, but the Lord's saying, "Uh uh-uh, not yet. I still have a move for this nation. I still have a message that has to be preached. I hear that all the time with California. "Uh Uh-uh, not yet. There are certain things that are going to come in California, okay, according to the justice of God. But the Lord is saying, uh-uh, not yet. I still have a harvest. I still have a crop of souls that will come out of that place. Amen? She wanted to kill him, but she could not. The spirit that was operating in the dark ages wanted to snuff out the Holy Ghost ministry, but he could not. Amen? Verse 21, then an opportune day came. Right? Satan waits for the opportune day. An opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. Right? 
It's party time for Herod. It's birthday time. It's celebration. Let's pass around the wine. Let's get drunk, right? That was the day. It was celebration. It usually comes when you're not expecting it, right? The enemy wants to come for his opportune day, but it's usually not your opportune day, right? That's why the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Amen? To whom he may devour us, who he, he, he's granted permission by people to devour them, right? But this was the opportune day when Jezebel knew. This is a Jezebel spirit operating here, right? This is an Ahab-Jezebel situation. How many guys see that, right? You have the Elijah messenger, John, and then you have Ahab, which is Herod, and then you have Jezebel, which is Herodias, his brother's wife. But Jezebel waits for that moment, for that right time, right? And, uh, you know, drunkenness in Scripture can represent many things. Drunkenness can be a good thing, right, where we get under the influence of the Holy Ghost, amen? But drunkenness can also refer to delusion. Delusion where we can no longer sense God. We can no longer hear God. We can no longer feel what God feels about a message, right? That's when the conscience becomes seared. That's when God is screaming to the top of his lungs and warning you, but you can't hear him. You're seared in your conscience, right? There's many people that are in that place in America, I believe, right now. There's many people that have been in that place for a long time in the ministry. It's a dangerous place, right? I believe that pretty much every person that's exposed in ministry on a national level has had to come to some level of being seared. And I believe that God's warned, been warning them for years, right? I don't believe that God just pulls the trigger on someone. I believe there's many, many warnings. I believe that God is so gracious and he, he wars and he contends. And there usually comes a place where the Lord says, all right, you're not responding all these years. Well, I'm going to have to shake things up to really get to your soul. Because ultimately, God cares nothing about your public image and your public ministry at the expense of your soul. He will burn down your ministry and completely ruin your name in the eyes of man if it means saving your soul. Amen? And when a minister gets to a place where the ministry and his name and his reputation becomes the idol, exalted high, God will with pleasure tear down that idol to save a soul. Amen? But the Bible says, listen to this. Bear with me, I'm almost done. When Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced, okay? It pleased Herod and those who sat with him. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. That's a high level of deception there. That's a high level of, 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 of deception and, and delusion, but it's also seduction, okay? And I want to tell you it's also multi-generational, right? The seduction that comes from Jezebel in the church, it's multi-generational. And it's very, very appealing, right? How could it be appealing to reject God? How could it be enticing to say no to God, to cut off the move of God? I have news for you. It can be very enticing for a number of different reasons, for a number of different reasons, right? But this is how this spirit works. It comes in and it seduces. It doesn't just come in and say, hey, give me his head, right? It comes in and it dances and it, and, it, and it gets you, it gets uh, leaders to, to say certain things. It gets leaders to open themselves up to different options, right? I tell you what, it's a dangerous place when we even just begin to entertain. You know, I think we'll just, we'll, I think we'll just let this move of God pass. You know, I think we'll just stay out of this one. There's a little too much controversy, a little too much heat on it, right? I believe the Lord is speaking to some leaders right now. You don't have to be Herod. You don't have to be a king in Israel that meet, misses your moment of visitation. You don't have to let the Jezebel spirit control things and cut off the word of God, cut off the message that God's bringing. You guys follow me here tonight? Verse 24, so she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Now go back to verse 23. I skipped that. It says he also swore to her. Listen to this. It's like he's not just saying, ask me, I'll give you anything. But he's like going beyond. He's like, I swear to you 
Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Right? Now, I think it's interesting because I believe what this points to is that there's, there's real estate involved, right? There's land involved. There's money involved, right? And I think the main message right now to us is that when you receive what God does in the next wave, it will cost you. It will cost you, right? <clears throat> the Bible says that we're born naked and we will leave this world naked, amen? We can't be so held on to possessions, so held on to our ministry, to our this, to our that, that we miss God, right? Now, Herod could have laid down his kingdom for the Lord, and he could have received the Lord. Or, if you don't lay down your kingdom for the Lord, you end up giving it to Jezebel. Are you seeing where I'm going with that? That's what I'm trying to get out here. Trying to minister, right? But ultimately, you will enter this world naked. You will leave this world naked. Might as well give it all up for Jesus every single day. Amen? You might as well give it all up for Jesus every single day. Kushambabaya. But uh, what I see here in the scripture is I see that somehow Jezebel ends up owning real estate in the church through seduction. She ends up owning things. And you say, Lord, we can't follow you. What, what if the Lord comes to a movement and says, everything you've been preaching the last 30 years, or not everything, but you've been preaching this and you made, you know, wrote many books on that. It's actually wrong. I want to change your mind. I want to grant you repentance on that, right? I once heard of a, a minister who was preaching, you know, on the end times, and, uh, you know, he, he made this whole ministry out of it, made a lot of money, and he just wrote a brand new book about the subject, and the truck backed up to the house, you know, or to his office, unloaded box after box of the new book, right? Anybody r r wrote a book in here? You get the new books in the, in the box. They're all crisp and fresh. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And it's like, oh, it's like Christmas, right, in June, right? And uh, he opens up the first box, and the Lord speaks to him and says, everything in that book's a lie. <laughs> he says, you've just wrote lies. He says, you need to repent. And he said, Lord, you couldn't have told me before I had them printed? And the Lord said, nope. It's going to cost you to get back on the straight and the narrow. It's going to cost you to get back in the truth. The Lord will do that. The Lord will come to us at an opportune day, at an opportune time, and say, are you going to follow me? Are you going to take up your cross? Are you willing to, to pay the price? Amen? That's why we have to be very careful the way we build. The way we build. We ultimately cannot be tethered to the things of this world. This is not my ministry. This is the Lord's ministry. Amen. Everything I own is the Lord's. And if I have to put it on the altar to follow God and do what's right, I'm going to do that. Amen. I'm going to do that. And that's one of the dangers that happens in the church. We, we get going in the move of God and millions of dollars is flowing and buildings are being erected and all this stuff. And uh, before we know it, Jezebel owns up to half the real estate. The, the book that was inspired by Jezebel built that building up there with all the proceeds. And then you got to go burn it down because it requires repentance. You know, many times when you repent, you have to reject that spirit that you've been partnering with. And that spirit makes a lot of people very wealthy in the church. So you have to deny not just the spirit, not just the teaching, but you have to deny all the comfort that comes with that spirit. Right? There was a certain level of security that Herod secured for himself, even within his own house, by bowing to Jezebel, by allowing himself to be seduced. Right, But I tell you what, I want to have the heart that says, you know what, Herod, you can have your cushy house. I'll go you know, sit next to John in the, in the jail cell if it means following God. Here you go. Here's my head right next to John. I'm going to follow Jesus. Amen? So uh, I pray that message ministered to you tonight. I know it ministered to my heart afresh. It's been a little while since, uh, since I preached it. Sometimes I feel the spirit and power of Elijah come, that preparatory anointing, uh, anointed message. And I felt that tonight as I was on the front row. I just began to weep, and I said, Lord, let me not be a Herod. Lord, I pray let us not be Herod leaders in the church in America. 
Let us be among those that receive what you're about to do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. Lord, we thank you for the word of the Lord that's coming to us in this hour. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving us without a comforter. Thank you for not leaving us, Lord, without a teacher. Lord, you said you'd send the Holy Ghost and he would teach us and remind us of all the things that Jesus is saying and that Jesus taught. Lord, I pray, remind the American church in this hour what it is that Jesus taught and expose the things that we've been teaching in the name of the Lord that he never said and that he never endorsed. Lord, I pray that, that we call these meetings prophetic shift. Let there be a shift, Lord God, back to the word, Lord. Let there be a shift, Lord, back to the apostolic gospel. The apostolic church. Oh, to be a minister of the gospel in the early church meant many times to be a martyr as well. Many times you could not preach the gospel without the mantle of the martyr as well. Lord, let there come the spirit of the martyr back into the American church. That men and women would say, like Daniel and like those three Hebrew boys, God will deliver us out of this furnace that we find ourselves in. But let it be known, King, even if He doesn't deliver us, we will not bow the knee. We will not bow the knee to the spirits that are flexing their muscles in this land. They may take our nonprofit status. They may kick us off of social media. They may cripple our ability to raise money and to raise funds and to bring in income. But Lord, they are not our source. You are our source. Our help comes from above. And Lord, you are going to get your message out regardless of how much they resist. So Lord, I pray that you would release a fresh anointing, God, in this season to raise up bold men and women of God who are as bold as lions. Let the righteousness of God rise up in us. The righteous shall be as bold as lions, the Bible says. Come on, do we got any of those lions here tonight? We got any of those lionesses here tonight? Let the lion of the tribe of Judah come forth, I pray, in this hour, in the American church. And I'm saying, Lord, roar here in Nebraska. Roar here in the Omaha region, God. Release a sound, God. Release your message. God, what is on your heart now? What is the rhema word now? God, I want to be right in the middle of what you're thinking, of what you're saying now. And Lord, I will pay the price, God, to be on the cutting edge of the word that's proceeding from your mouth now. Let me not settle, God, for a word of the previous season that's comfortable and that's safe and that people have wrapped their minds around. Lord, let me be fully committed, God, to the word that's proceeding from your mouth now. Come on, saints, we have anybody here tonight that would say, Lord, I want to be among those. I want to be among those radical bridal warriors that will say, I will not deny the Lord. I will not deny His Word. I believe the Lord would say, out of this place and out of this heartland, and out of this land here in America, I have purpose for my word to go forth. I have purpose not only for the sword, but for the gavel of the judge to strike down in this place. And the Lord says there will be demonstrations of how I will shake the entire nation in the days to come as precursors that come even to this land, even to this area. The Lord says look for signs that precede my coming in a special way in this land in the days to come. 
It will not be coincidence who I send here in the days to come. There will be many that will put their eyes and set their sights on Nebraska for the work that I have, not just here in these people, but for the entire nation in the days to come. Look for radical young people and even radical old people to come out of this place. The Lord says, I cannot have the next move without the Joshua and Caleb's with the next generation. Can I hear an amen? Wow. I see, a, I see into the Spirit right now. Uh, men and ministers and pastors, even in this place, receiving a call to go out. Receiving that call, like I described earlier with Kenneth Hagin, you're not supposed to be in the same capacity, in the same vocation that you've been in in the last season. Step out of your boat and watch what doors I open in this next season. But I literally saw like pastors in the area taking their pulpits and putting it over their shoulders like a cross. And there's some men and women, they're going to have to pay a price to follow the Lord. They're going to have to take a price, uh, pay a price, to take their pulpits on the road. It'll be like bearing a cross, a heavy cross. But the Lord says, it is not yours to bear alone. I'm there with you. Hey, shambabakurra basinda la basambabaya. Brace kalabotombra kai shambabaya shambaya. Lord, we know that your burden is easy. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light, Lord. You've already appropriated the grace, Lord God, to bear the next mantle, Lord, to step into the next season, to bear the responsibilities that come with saying yes to God today and tomorrow. Grace, Lord. Grace, Lord. Grace. Grace. I just feel this very, very strongly, uh, a pastor. The Lord is going to continue to challenge you. The Lord, I see like the Lord playing a, a, a game of dare with you. I dare you. Hey, I dare you. <laughs> but you're not going to hold back because of of previous shakings in your life. You're not going to hold back because things didn't go the way you thought they should have when you stepped out the last time. The Lord's going to continue to do a kingdom work in you that's like that of a little child. The trust of God is going to grow the more dangerous it gets, the more risky it gets. Hey, the more you get out on that limb, I, I feel the Lord saying, the more you're going to discover your wings. Hey, and there are seasons of walking, but there are seasons of running, and there are seasons of soaring in the Lord. You have not been weary in well-doing. You have not been weary in what God has asked of you in these previous seasons. But God's saying, I'm about to bring an accelerator into your life. I'm about to bring an accelerator into your life because you are among those who have the heart that I've been looking for. You are among those who have the heart that I've been looking for. In your heart, you say yes to God. In your heart, you rise with a yes on your lips and you go to bed with a yes on your lips. And the Lord says, I have seen it. It has not gone unnoticed. It is not gone unnoticed. Hey, shitalabakumbra So Lord, we just bless Lord God. I pray you let him receive even a fresh anointing for revival, God. For fire, God. Hey! Fire, Lord. Kurabasindalabasambaya. A ministry, God, of fire workers, Lord. Shindalabaturabakiandaya. Just put your hand on your head right now. Say, Lord, make me a minister of fire. Make me a minister of fire. God, make me a burning and a shining lamp, God, of revival. When the disciples came to Jesus and they asked who John was, he said he was a burning and a shining lamp in this place. And you did not bear witness of that light that he brought. 
But I tell you, Elijah has already come, he said. And you did not bear witness of it. You did not recognize it. God, and make us ambassadors of fire. And let us know, God, when it's fire from you, even when we come into fellowship with others that carry the fire. Prepare us for the fire that will fall on Baptists. Prepare us for the fire that will fall on the Catholics. Prepare us for the fire that will fall on people that maybe in our hearts we don't think the fire belongs to. I I sense the Spirit of God saying right now, I would remind you that John the Baptist was a wild man. I would remind you that he came out with the camel's hair and the raiment of the, the camel's hair of his garment and he had locust legs sticking out of his teeth. And he was not acting like everybody else said he should act. And the Lord says, I will offend men and women's heads to reveal their hearts at times. Lord, let us get past being offended with You, Lord. Let us overcome being offended, Lord, with what You're about to do, Lord. Let us be healed. Grant unto us the gift of repentance, God, in this hour. Grant our family, God, the gift of repentance, God. Grant our children, God, the gift of repentance. My children should come into the kingdom in this next move of God. My nephews and nieces will come into the kingdom in this next move of God. Spouses will come into the kingdom in this next move of God. People out of Silicon Valley are going to come into the kingdom. The homosexuals are going to come into the kingdom. Atheists, God-haters are going to come into the kingdom. There's a new generation on the scene, says the Lord. They have hearts full of justice, but they've been directed in many ways towards Satan's justice. But the Lord says, I have stirred many of them to justice and they will come into the kingdom and they will be converted with the heart for justice, says the Lord. I see many Paul the Apostles coming out of this generation in the days to come. The ones that were the most antagonistic to God. The ones that were persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. That were persecuting Christ. God's going to blind them to get their eyes open. He's going to visit them. How do you guys believe that? Lord, let there, be, let there be Saul on the road to Damascus encounters right here in Omaha, God. We pray, God, for the streets of Omaha. We pray, God, for the marketplace in this place. Visit people, God. Visit people, God. Despite their antagonism to you. Despite their hatred for God. And just just tarry on with me for a moment in the spirit of prayer if you could. Lord, I pray for the White House right now. I pray for our leaders right now, God. Help me to pray for them, God, as if they were my own children. Because I know they're your children, God. You love them. You died for them. Lord, I pray for our president. I pray for our leaders, God. I pray that they would hear your voice, God. I pray that they would respond to your call, Lord. I pray let them be saved, Lord. Let them be filled with the Holy Ghost, God. Let them be touched, Lord. Let them be changed, Lord. Help them to grasp the seriousness of the hour. Help them to grasp, Lord, the reality of eternity, God. You said in Ecclesiastes that you have set eternity in every man's heart. Let them be in touch, Lord God, with eternity. Let them understand the ramifications of their decisions, God. We pray, God, for grace, God. We pray for mercy, God. Lord, I bless what you're doing in California right now. I bless what you're doing, Lord, around the nation, God. I pray that the wind of the Spirit, God, 
the wind of revival, let it continue to blow, continue to stir her, Lord. Lord, we want to see Acts chapter 4. Behold their threatenings. Behold their threatenings. Stretch forth your hand and heal by the name of your holy child, Jesus. Bear witness to what we preach with resurrection power, Lord. Let our resurrection message not just be Easter eggs once a year, but let it be the power of God unto salvation. Let it be the power of the gospel, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you believe it tonight, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow. Is that the music? <laughs> Anybody hear that little rumble there? Maybe I'm hearing the Spirit. I don't know. I heard a rumble right at the end of that. You heard that? Hey, that's what happened in Acts 4. The whole house shook. Where they were gathered together, I'm telling you. It's going to happen. Amen? God's going to show up. Amen? He's sending forth His angels. The last thing I have to say, Pastor... I believe this is for you and your church. I believe that you're called to be a messenger of fire, uh, likened unto Hebrews chapter 1. He sends forth his spirits as winds. His angelic ministers, they come as winds. They work with the servants who are ministers of fire. And I believe there's a coming an acceleration because there, I believe there's a new order of angelic ministry that's going to come to you. And it's going to come to your church and you need to read, if you haven't read it in a while, 2 Samuel chapter 5. David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, Do not march on the Philistines until you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. Don't advance on the enemy until the angel armies are beside you. And the Lord granted them breakthrough, and they named that place Baal Perazim, the Lord of the breakthrough, and it represented where the Lord broke through the lines of the enemy. The Lord, I believe, wants to send reinforcements of the angelic order into this city and into this place for a breakthrough of the kingdom of God. Amen? You guys believe that? So that's part of growing as ministers of fire. We learn to work more with the angels. We, we learn to work more with heaven. Amen? So that's all I have for tonight. Um, Tomorrow, I am going to pray for everybody that comes. If you're going to want to come tomorrow, I'll lay hands on everybody. Amen. I'm not promising everybody a word, but I will lay hands on everybody who comes to the meeting. Amen. And uh, we'll see what the Lord does. Um, I'm going to pray for the sick again tomorrow. Um, so come expecting uh, that as well. Amen. We've seen some great uh, miracles in our ministry over the years, but we've only scratched the surface. Amen. We're going to see greater. I'm hungry for a greater dimension there as well. Amen. Uh, but God bless you. I pray you would go home and sleep wonderfully. And uh, may you have visitations of the Lord tonight. Amen. Come on, Pastor. Bless you. Come on, give it up for Pastor as he comes.